So, welcome to this vector webinar on secure in vehicle communication with MagSec. My name is Till Neudecker, and I'm a technical product manager for security in our embedded software. Um, and together with my colleagues Julia and Matthias, uh, I will host this webinar. Julia still has some uh, trouble joining WebEx, um, so I hope she will um, join. In the meantime, uh, we can start with a brief introduction and the first topic. So maybe Matthias, you can briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. My name is Matthias Schwedt. I'm product manager at Vector for the Ethernet interfaces. So I am responsible for the hardware part in this session, um, yeah, I will uh, make a scope on the, the hardware aspects of MagSec, why you need to have MagSec also in the interfaces available for your tests and will highlight some use cases and which hardware will be available from Vector in the future. Yeah, so if you have any questions during the webinar, please enter the questions in the Q&A um, window of WebEx. So WebEx has one chat window and one Q&A window. So please just use the um, Q&A window for your questions because then all the questions will be sorted and um, we can address them at the end in the Q&A. If you have any technical questions, anything that is not working, just um, post it to the chat. So. Um, in case anything is, is not right there, you can just directly post it in the chat window. So let's get started. Um, let's begin with some basics on MagSec. Uh, then I'll also give a brief introduction in how MagSec is implemented in our embedded Microsoft software. Then um, Julia will take over the presentation of MagSec in our tooling in our canoe and um, Matthias, as we just explained, will take over the network interfaces part. So before we dive into the topic, um, let's look at the big picture um, here for MagSec. Uh, so when we see a vehicle architecture, um, we see a lot of different ECUs in the vehicle. And we also see many different security controls that are distributed across these ECUs. So we see things like hardware security modules. We see things like secure communication protocols overall. And we see things like secure policing, which is, for example, in diagnostic access control and access control for service oriented communication and so on. And MAXEC is one way to realize a secure communication between different ECUs. So what MagSec can protect against is against manipulation of data on a network bus, against replay of old data, and also against eavesdropping of data. So what is MagSec? In a nutshell, MagSec is a secure communication protocol on the data link layer, on the MAC layer of Ethernet. And MAXEC uses a protocol called MAXEC key agreement as a management protocol. So I'll explain later what exactly this means, but what's important here is that we got the MAXEC part and we got some control layer on top of, um, of MAXEC that controls the actual MAXEC operation. MAXEC can be operated either using pre-shared keys or using certificate-based authentication. Then it is operated together with EAP TLS. And MAXEC can be used to protect the authenticity and also the confidentiality of Ethernet frames. Now, the main benefits of MAXEC are that MAXEC can be um, hardware accelerated. So that um, if you have a MAXEC capable transceiver, for example, on an existing ECU design, this transceiver can basically protect all the payload at a very high speed. So if you have, let's say, one gigabit um, of, of network um, bandwidth, then 
this transceiver can in hardware protect uh, at line speed all the traffic without any impact on the um, on the host CPU or host HSM. Another advantage of MacSec is that it can also be used to protect non-IP Ethernet traffic. So for example, if there are any video streams, AVB, whatever, that cannot be protected using other protocols, um, MacSec can protect this data. Now, speaking of other protocols, um, we already got several protocols that are available and that are in use in the automotive um, Ethernet networks or in automotive networks in general. So let's just make this brief comparison um, between these, these different protocols to see what are the differences here. So let's maybe start with SecOC because SecOC is probably the most widely used and also the um, the protocol that has been used for the longest time. And what SecOC does is it protects the integrity of single PDUs. So everything that is a PDU in AutoSAR, you can protect with SecOC. And SecOC itself is a very simple protocol. So we use symmetric keys to calculate a MAC. And this symmetric key is being used on transmission to generate the MAC and on reception to, to validate the MAC. So although SecOC itself is quite simple, the main complexity here is, is pushed to the freshness value management. Um, so overall SecOC is also, like in combination with freshness value management becomes a little bit more complex, but that's kind of the, the basic um, protocol that is used quite widely. Then another protocol that is um, also used is TLS or DTLS um, and with the TLS we can protect the integrity and the confidentiality on the TCP or UDP layer. So we can protect the whole payload, for example, of a TCP, um, of a TCP channel and TLS is quite often used for off-board communication. So for example, if an ECU communicates to a smart charging um, station, this is usually protected by TLS. But TLS can also be used for um, in-vehicle communication. And TLS can be operated e either with certificates or with pre-shared keys. Now, in the going one stack or one layer down in the, in the ISO layers, we got IPsec, which is on a very high level, similar to TLS, just that it protects the whole IP. Uh, yeah, basically everything that is on top of IP. So we can protect multiple TCP channels um, with one IPsec connection. And then finally, we got MacSec, uh, which I just explained. We can protect the integrity and the confidentiality on the Ethernet layer. So again, we're one layer down. Uh, we can use certificates or pre-shared keys. And one of the main differences here to the other protocols is that MacSec is usually operated in a hop by hop manner. So that means that we protect not end to end from the sender to the receiver, but that we protect from the sender to the switch and then from the switch to the receiver again. So, Basically the same picture um, as we had before, but now um, in a more in a more technical way. So I'll just go over this very briefly, and um, I just like to to give you the idea here that with the different protocols, we are basically moving the protection down the layers. So while SecOC is protecting on a on a very high layer, with MacSec we are pushing the protection quite down in the in the protocol stack. So now we are here really on the Ethernet layer where we are protecting the data. Now I mentioned that you can use certificates or pre-shared keys for um, or MacSec and that there is also this MacSec key agreement protocol. So let's make an example of how all of this um, comes together and, and works together. So let's assume we got two peers here, peer A and peer B, and they want to communicate via MacSec. And now if we assume that they are using this certificate-based authentication, what this means is that when the connection between 
these two are is established. So, for example, the vehicle um, is started, and now these ECUs are are up. So they want to communicate. Then, if they are using this certificate-based authentication, then the first step is that an EIP TLS handshake will happen between these two peers, which is similar to the normal TLS handshake, just with a difference that um, the TLS frames, the PLS payload is encapsulated in these EAP frames. But the idea is that both peers now authenticate using certificates. Um, the peers can validate the certificates and the result of this handshake is a shared secret. And this shared secret, this connectivity association key is then used in the next step as an input to the MAXA key agreement. And now, because I mentioned you can use certificate-based authentication, but you can also use pre-shared keys. So if you do not use certificates, then you can just pre-share this connectivity association key. So in the end, if this CAK here is just in the ECU, then you don't need this um, EAP TLS before. And of course, from performance perspective, um, this saves some time because this EAP TLS takes some time because we need to validate certificates and so on. Now, what MAXA key agreement does is it uses the CAK to protect its own communication. And basically what it does is it establishes the common parameters between the two peers that are used for MAXAC and it distributes a, let's say, session key. So this secure association key, that's kind of a session key and that session key is then being used together with the parameters that were established to actually protect the payload using MAXAC. So you also see there are different um, there are different specifications for these two layers here. So we got the control layer up here, and then this is the actual payload protection using MAXAC. And <clears throat> this is the part that is usually performed in hardware at line speed, whereas the MKA is something that can be executed in a software stack. So as I mentioned, the network architecture is a little bit different compared to protocols like um, TLS or SecOC because MAXEC is usually operated in this hop by hop manner. And the implications of this are um, that first, the switch has to support MAXEC. So for example, if you use TLS, the switch doesn't really care about the TLS, so there is no need to support TLS on the switch. But here with MAXEC, if we're operating this in this hop by hop manner, we have to support uh, MAXEC on the switch. Then the next thing is that from security perspective, um, from security perspective, the switch becomes a trusted ent entity. So if the switch is compromised, well, the, overall the system is, is compromised. So the switch, um, yeah, becomes this, let's say, single point of failure for, for, um, yeah, for security. But on the other hand, it's also an advantage because the switch can modify the data and <clears throat> for, for certain features, for example, for <clears throat> um, adding the queuing times in, um, in, in TSN, in time synchronization features, there <clears throat> it's just needed that the switch can modify the data. And finally, another implication of this is that this architecture reduces the number of connections that are needed compared to an end-to-end -end connection. So if you say you have 10 connections or if you have 10, 10 ECUs, if you have this hop-by-hop -hop approach, it will be 10 connections because it's 10, well, like one connection from the switch to each of the ECUs. Whereas if you would have end-to-end -end connections, it would be basically nine plus eight plus, plus seven plus six. So it would be many more connections here. Now, another topic that often arises is, well, how can MAXEC be combined with VLANs? Because if we look at the Ethernet frames, um, what happens here is that for VLANs, we got this, um, basically the VLAN tag that is in here where usually the, the Ether type is, and then the remaining payload with the actual inner Ether type is then behind. 
And for MaxSec, in the same place, uh, we got this SecTech that contains MaxSec relevant information. So it's often a question, how can these be combined? And the usual approach here is to have the VLAN tech behind the MaxSec SecTech. So in the end, what this means here is we first got the MaxSec information, and then we got within the MaxSec information uh, as a protected payload from MaxSec perspective, we got the VLAN tech, and then we finally got the inner um, either type of the actual payload. So that's how it's usually being done, but there are also um, exceptions. So it's possible to yeah, reverse this order or change this order so that the VLAN is transmitted first and the SecTech is, um, is part of the VLAN. So this is also possible. It depends a little bit on the system and on the hardware, but let's say the usual approach here is to have the SecTech outside of the VLAN tech. Now, one other question or topic that often arises is the topic of the inter-packet gap. And um, the problem here is basically that if we are doing MAXEC, like it is being done currently quite often in a transceiver, then the data that is being transmitted on the wire will contain this additional MAXEC information, like MAC, this ICV here, or this SecTech that I just showed. But the payload that is being seen by the Ethernet controller will not, because the MaxSec transceiver will take care of all of this. So that's actually a quite nice property. So you can retrofit a MaxSec capable transceiver on an existing ECU design. Um, but it means that what the Ethernet controller sees will be different than what is actually transmitted on the wire. And so what can happen is if the, Ethernet trans, uh, if the Ethernet controller is transmitting frames at a very high rate, that then the transceiver will get trouble to fit in the additional data because the, uh, the controller will just send as fast as he can, but the transceiver won't or is not able to do that because um, he cannot keep up with the speed because he has to put additional data in the Ethernet frame. And so what this means um, is we have to account for this additional data and we have to account for this in two ways. So first is we have to reduce the payload size that we can send. So in the end, we cannot make Ethernet frames bigger than they are allowed to be by the Ethernet standard. So we cannot put more data in here than um, what is allowed. So in the end, we have to reduce the payload that we can transmit. And then with the addition of the MaxSec data, the frame will still fit into the, into the Ethernet frame. And the other thing that we have to do is we have to increase the gaps between two frames. And if we increase the gaps between two frames, then we can even keep the minimal required gap between two Ethernet frames on the transceiver side after adding the MaxSec data. So this is something that um, is important to consider, and that's yeah, quite, of, quite often a point of discussion here. So that was it for the basics. Now let's have a brief look into the implementation in our embedded software. So what we have in our Ethernet stack here is a new component uh, that implements the MKA protocol, so the MAXI key agreement protocol. And this component sits on top of the Ethernet interface. And the Ethernet interface will get the actual data, the payload from the Ethernet controller that it yeah, receives somehow through, for example, like from the hardware, for example, using DMA. And what MKA does is it sends and receives these MKA frames that are used to uh, coordinate with the other peer, exchange the session key and so on. So this is the normal, let's say, communication path that is being done here. And what MKA also does is it configures MaxSec. So there are additional interfaces now in the Ethernet interface and in the Ethernet transceiver. And in the end, MKA tells the transceiver how to configure or the 
it tells the transceiver driver how to configure the transceiver so that it performs MAXEC. And then the, let's say the normal payload, if we have, for example, TCP IP communication is just protected by MAXEC, but this is completely um, transparent to the other upper layers. So the other upper layers just don't see anything of MAXEC because the actual protection will happen down here on the transceiver side. Now, what is also added is basically the same thing, not for a transceiver, but for a switch. So the scenario here is very similar. The only difference is that now we are configuring not only one port of one transceiver, but probably many ports of an Ethernet switch. Configuration of all of this is done through the normal configurator five. So I'm not going into the details here, but in the end, it's possible to configure the different MKA instances, configure the references to the crypto um, jobs. So everything that is needed to um, configure from MKA side and from XX side can be configured in the configurator. And finally, just some information on what is already there and what our plans here are. Um, MAXEC has been standardized in AutoZAR with the previous release. So it's now exactly one year since it, since it has been standardized. And in our MicroZAR Classic implementation, we have this MKA implementation available, SQM. The feature set is still a little bit reduced, but we're working on um, yeah, making this really feature complete. Then on the transceiver driver side, we have some transceivers that we are already supporting and additional transceivers um, will be supported as our capacity and project demand um, allows or requires. MAXEC switch support is currently quite a hot topic and there we plan to introduce um, support in, into our vSwitch solution so that it's possible to use MAXEC within um, switches as well. What we currently do not have planned is an implementation for EIP TLS, um, mainly because of the performance impact that we see for using EIP TLS at the startup. And what we also do not have planned is a MAXEC implementation in software so that if you don't have a, a MAXEC capable transceiver, it would still be possible to implement MAXEC, but there um, usually the performance of, of such an approach is not, um, not sufficient. And finally, for the adaptive side, we also currently do not have an implementation plan there. So that's it from my side, and I would hand over to Julia uh, for the canoe topics. Julia, I think you're muted. At least I cannot hear you. Thank you. So uh, welcome also from my side. My name is Julia Trieflinger and I'm a software development engineer in the field of Ethernet um, and do. Yeah, so and therefore I want to show you how you can configure Canoe that you can use MaxSec. And I want to show you four aspects. The first one is the port configuration because as Till already mentioned, it only works if you have really concrete hardware and so we need physical ports. Um, and then the next thing is of course security, which is very important and that you can see what actually goes on. I want to show you on, in the trace, um, we have separated the trace window to the simulated ports and the physical ones. And last but not least, the fault injection. As an example, which goes with Canoe 17, is a chat example. Um, the chat example itself exists already quite a long time, but in this case, of course, we want to have it max executed. So the two physical ports, port one and port two, one shall be max executed. And um, they are on a switch. And on the right side, you see that we have virtual ports. So let's go to the 
canoe demo. I will stop my video because I have the presentation on the other monitor. So I hope you see the demo. I actually already opened Canoe. And for all of you who want to know where is the sample configuration, we have here the tab sample configuration and you can go to the Ethernet and here it is. So that is something I've already opened. And then you have this view. In this view in the simulation setup, we are on a network named Ethernet. In this case, we have three nodes, chat server, chat client one and chat client two. Behind there are the switches. Um, for fault injection, we have also a Ethernet packet builder. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is the hardware configuration. Um, I configured my hardware It takes a while and that's on the other monitor. So as you have already seen, I have the two physical ports. One is master, one is slave, doesn't matter which one, and the two switches. So that is already done. I go to the port configuration with this the interesting part. And you see here again, the physical ports, port one and port two. And that is the view I get from the network hardware. I will switch off my hardware um, and go again to the port configuration. And now you see, because I'm not attached, I don't see anything. So I make sure, or you make sure <laughs> when you have your own configuration that you are attached. So in my case, my hardware is a VN5620, which I have plugged in again. And I see that um, here are my physical parts and I want to measure the physical parts, but also the virtual ones that I can see the communication. What's going on? OK, so hardware is attached. That is fine. The next point is the security settings. Security settings you will find in the simulation tab. And go here to the security configuration. As Till already mentioned, um, you can combine MAXEC with other security protocols. In our case, we are just interested in MAXEC. So um, depending on which hardware you have, your hardware maybe is already capable of MAXEC and maybe not. So if not, you can simulate it. But um, as already said, you need a physical parts. Um, here you can choose if it's if you want to prefer hardware of, or if you want to have use software or hardware. Um, okay, um, in the example, we already enabled MaxSec because of course we want to use MaxSec. So because the two ticks here are on, MaxSec is enabled. If I would disable them, then the configuration will work, but of course without MaxSec. So then I have just normal config, uh, just normal communication without security. But um, if I just tick on one of them, there will be no communication because this one tries with MKA to get a communication, but it of course does not work, and so he will be stuck. So no security then take off both of them. If you want to have security, make sure that both of them are enabled. For MaxSec, we have always two roles. In our case, we call them supplicant and authenticator. So on port two, that was our chat server, um, or our switch with the chat server, and the supplicant is on our chat switch one with chat client one and chat client two. So it is just names. And actually, if you want to switch it, um, you can do in our scenario, it doesn't matter which one has the role. It's just important that <laughs> both roles are available. So but I leave it in this case and say, OK, that's fine. Um, 
security is enabled. Now let's have a look what actually does supplicant and authenticator mean. So I opened here um, the security manager and I've already opened the corresponding security profile. So here you see the file-based PKE. This is included in the example. So if you have CANU 17, you get all of that. Here you see the two names and here I could rename them. So if I don't want to have it called authenticator or supplicant, I could give them other names, but these are the names which you have seen before in the security configuration. So when you just open or have a few look at the example, these two um, configurations of these the two parts are nearly identical. The only difference is in the key server priority and the lower the value, the higher the priority. So this one has actually, because it has such a high value, a very low priority. So therefore we call it supplicant. This one has a much lower value, therefore higher priority and it's called authenticator. Just to play around, um, I would change some parameters or show you some parameters as well. So in this case, you can, depending on which cipher suite you want to use, you could use a AES-256 as well. Of course, then you have <laughs> to make sure that all over it will be changed and that the key keys are corresponding, oh, sorry. Um, then I have here the hello time. So with MKA, um, the supplicants or the participants have to say that they are still there. And I can sh um, tell them how often they shall change. So for example, I, you see, you'll see later in the trace um, the difference. And um, I also, no, normally authentication is the important thing, but that you even more see clearly what is going on, I will change it to encryption as well. So now our data is not only authenticated, but also encrypted. The pre-shared key, which Till um, also mentioned, so in this scenario, it only works with pre-shared key. The pre-shared key is um, defined here above, I don't, um, so here you see the name and it corresponds to this one. But that is not so interesting. The, in, the most interesting thing is the priority and the policy. Of course, the names have to fit. And then depending on what you want to do with MagSec, um, you can say if you want to have a replay protection, if you want to have a rekey configuration so that you want to change your key after, um, maybe some time or after some limit of payload um, has already been sent. That is also stuff you can just change here. So, but I think with the hello time and with the authentication and encryption, we already can see quite a lot. So I will close this security manager. We have enabled this one. And now just let's start and have a look what is happening. So I start a configuration and you see in the beginning that the ports are disabled. While actually the ports are disabled, you cannot send, of course, anything through the two ports. So I will try again. So I start and I hope I'm fast enough just to send and you will see there will be no message. And of, it's, you have seen in the beginning there was nothing and only after the MAC key agreement um, have been succeeded, we got the communication through the server and the chat clients. So first it's just that they kind of say, hey, okay, I'm connected. They haven't sent anything yet. But what you see here in the payload is the connection. So here are the physical ports and here are the simulated ports or the virtual ports. So this is what normally um, when you open CANU, everything is in 
one configuration, but here we filtered the ports. So we have only the ports, the virtual ports, and here we have only the physical ports. Just that it's clear that here is the MAXEC communication, which we really can have a look onto what is going on through the ports one and port two, which are max execute. And here is the communication in general. Okay, so here we see the payload that it's encrypted, while here we see the decrypted payload. Um, as I already mentioned, while the ports are disabled, nothing can go through. We can, we've also hidden what is going on in the, uh, behind the MAXEC, so some information. So if you just remove this filter, you see much more. You see, in this case, you see, okay, now port two has linked up and short time later, you see that port one has linked up as well. So these messages or information are hidden or kind of hidden. But if you want to see it, it's easy to get them. Um, I want to show you the hello time as well. And you see here that in one and a half seconds, so uh, maybe it's not a good, I, I just start again. So now here you see that is the supplicant with its hello time saying, hey, I'm still alive. And um, in the security profile, I entered one and a half seconds. So you see um, that later, oh, sorry, this one um, is again the liveness proof. For the key server, so for the authenticator, it's just every two seconds. And normally you don't have to change the parameters, but if you're not so familiar with MKA and just want to play around with the parameters, you can have a look what actually does it mean by changing the profile and looking what is happening in the concrete communication. Please don't mix up that here is hello again is our chat client example and they already always stood hello. So I don't want to say hello, but I want to send you a smiley. And you see here already um, the encrypted message, but on the left side, you see the decrypted message. And that is the reason why I wanted to encrypt the payload, just that it's even clearer that MAXEC is taking place on the right side. Um, of course, um, you don't have to encrypt. The most important aspect is the authentication. So, but here it says it's MAXEC, but is it really MAXEC? And when we have a look, then we see, ah, okay, we see our Ethernet frames. And then we see, as um, Till also said, that we have a type for MAXEC. And so we can interpret our Ethernet frame corresponding to the MAXEC protocol. And we have some security tags. And then here is our actually payload. And in the end, there is an integrity check value just to make sure that everything is fine. Okay. So in the end, now we see MAXEC is working. When we want to send a packet as an intruder, for example, sorry to go back to fault injection. Here already is a MAXEC secured packet, but of course the checksum does not fit because we haven't taken um, part into the a MAXEC key agreement protocol in this beginning. So we just, we can say, okay, we use MAXEC, but we don't really know the checksums and all, all the other flags. So we just say anything. And if we send this package, we get a MAXEC decode failed message. 
we could actually here add a, another packet and I haven't configured it yet, but so if you would configure it and then we would send it, you would see that it will be dropped. So if a packet go to port one or port two, which is not correctly MaxSec um, secured, then you will just, um, so or they don't, sorry, they don't wanna, um, I'm missing the words now. <laughs> yeah, so it, it will be dropped and you don't get the communication. And you can try, you can even copy an already, um, pack, a package with have already been sent and um, it won't fit to that and you will ever, you will always get a decode failed message. Yeah, that was it from my side. Um, then I will hand over to Matthias. Yeah, thank you, Julia. I take over. So hopefully this work in the resolution. <clears throat> okay. So um, yeah, Julia uh, demonstrated the uh, solution in Canoe, which is um, mainly the software-based solution of uh, for MaxSec. Um, the solution can be uh, used with any network interface you have because the complete MaxSec um, handling is completely done in Canoe. So the complete NKA handling as well as the encryption, decryption or authentication of the frames is completely done in Canoe. But as everything is done in Canoe um, and each frame which is received in a secure channel, um, must be processed by Canoe, and um, if there is a lot of traffic on different on several ports, um, this may be a problem. So it is um, a good point, or it is is um, yeah relevant to to have this also on an interface. Um, I like to uh, show you some relevant use cases where it makes sense to have um, Maxec also on board of a network interface and um, explain you which uh, use cases this is with R and um, uh, yeah, how the Maxic solution will work. So as a short or easy simple example, um, we have a switch with three ECUs and they all have a secure channel to communicate with each other and we have here um, a one-to-one -one, um, communication and what uh, Julia demonstrated that has um, is, is this a case here that if um, one ECU, for example, is simulated or remaining was simulated in Canoe, all the MaxSec relevant um, um, tasks are performed by Canoe. You can connect any interface and then you have your secure channel and communicate with the network with all participants in the network in a secure manner. But as I said, this has some drawbacks on the performance and um, therefore it makes sense to um, move this secured entity which runs in Canoe down to the hardware which can process a bit more efficient and more quickly the each frame and um, encrypt, decrypt the frames or authenticate the frames. And in this setup, um, we have here an uh, Ethernet Phi um, on the network interface which supports MaxSec and um, which does all, the, all the, the encryption part and forwards the frame to Canoe and Canoe um, um, takes care of the MKA uh, protocol and uh, communicates with the um, counterpart um, on that level to, to share the keys, to share the secrets and to update the hardware with the newest um, key agreements. So, but as, but as I said, performance is all in this in this setup here. So, if you think about to simulate multiple issues to connect multiple sub issues here, this will have a much bigger drawback um, on the performance. 
if we turn the use case around and we don't uh, simulate a single ECU, we simulate a switch ECU, then this uh, problem will increase because we have multiple ports which we need to, to secure and the hardware needs to process the frames on any port and um, therefore it makes sense to have the Maxec uh, part um, in the hardware. But this is uh, one of the use cases. Another use case is um, the, the capturing use case where you have uh, just a simple tab intruded in your link. So a tab is an element which you to put into your link to, to capture the data. It is a transparent element which forwards all data from left to the right and right to the left. And you can sniff uh, the data and forward it to your capturing tool. And um, if we now um, differentiate the two scenarios, um, one, um, when we only use authentication in our network, so you have all the all the relevant payload in plain text available, there's only the authentication authentication done via MagSec, then you can capture all the data with with current interfaces. There is no MagSec support required on the hardware because we can uh, process all data on the hardware. Um, also in in this case, and forward it to Canoe, and Canoe can display and handle MaxSec uh, decryption or protocol interpretation afterwards. So this is, in, if your network is only uh, using authentication, this solution works already today. But if you have here some kind of encryption running, then we are in scenario two and you need to encrypt um, or you, you share the secret of your network also with interface that we can encrypt and decrypt the frames and forward it to Canoe. So this is the, the case where you need also for TAP use case uh, network interface and therefore the hardware must support MagSec. So this just as a quick overview about the, the relevant use cases and um, now I, I like to, to come to the, the hardware itself. So with, we have MagSec already developed at Vector. So since our uh, latest driver version 2320, we have uh, MagSec um, on board and the, in, in software. The missing piece is the, the hardware itself. So we have on a 5650 device, changeable physical layer modules which will be upgraded um, with MagSec uh, in, in your future. So instead of next year, we will have this available and you can use um, here a MagSec capable variant of our 100,000 base uh, module. And we will have already available um, a solution for multi-gig. So there's the other way around. We have the hardware available, but the MagSec support is the missing piece in software. So this support will come with the uh, driver release in next quarter two. And uh, then we have MagSec uh, on hardware available for 100 base, 1000 base T1, as well as multi-gig automotive ethernet. So covering two and a half, five and 10G base T1. But we are also working on smaller interfaces supporting MagSec, but they are planned for late 2024 and 2025. So this was um, yeah, the, the hardware part. So we are now at the end of our presentation. Thank you for joining. Now we come to the Q&A session and answer your questions. Yeah, so let's have a look at the questions that are there. So um, the first question, that arrived here was whether only the payload is encrypted or even other fields of the Ethernet frame. Um, so as, as Julia mentioned, confidentiality um, is usually not the primary um, topic, but it's often more about authentication. So that's the first part of the answer here, at least in the for in vehicle communication, confidentiality is usually not the highest priority. Um, but still with MagSec, um, you can protect basically everything that is part of the payload of an um, Ethernet frame. So, for example, you can encrypt the IP header, 
but what you cannot encrypt is the um, the Ethernet header itself. So this one can only be authenticated, but not encrypted. Then there is a question on um, the SAK um, yeah, re, let's say reprovisioning. So as the SAK, it's like the session key is only valid for a certain time or um, a certain number of frames that can be protected with one SAK. Um, how is the update process defined and is there a need to run the complete MKA again? And I think that's um, if, if you looked very, very good at the trace that Julia showed, um, there are a few messages for MKA to just establish the initial connection. And then there are some messages to actually change a new SAK. So, and um, in case one SAK um, is about to expire, a new SAK is distributed using MKA. So we do not need to Form the complete MKA protocol again, but it's really just the I don't know four frames um, that are exchanged, where a new SAK is being transmitted from one peer to another, and then the other peer announces that it can now use this new SAK, and then um, basically both peers agree to then use the new SAK. So it's a very simple process, and it's also not that. Um, it it requires a lot of resources, so only yeah, quite simple symmetric encryption is needed here. Um, so this is something that can be just done regularly after a few hours, usually um, when the SAK needs to be renewed. Um, then there is a question on executing MKA within HSM or specifically within VHSM, so whether it's possible to execute MKA in our VHSM product. Um, so this is not possible, but actually that is this is also not needed. Um, so the usual setup is that you have within the VHSM the CAK, so the key that is used to protect the MKA communication, this is protected within the HSM. But the actual protocol implementation is something that we actually do not want to have as part of the M of the HSM, because then it would just increase the attack surface um, of the HSM. So we want to have the protocol implementation on the host side, and only the cryptographic operation that is needed, um, or where the access to the key is needed within the HSM. So what happens is that um, basically MKA uses the normal crypto stack with the CSM and the crypto driver to instruct the HSM to, for example, authenticate the MKA frames that are exchanged to wrap the SAK that is being exchanged. So the MKA implementation runs on the host and it uses the cryptographic implementation within the HSM. And that's the same pattern that we have for other protocols like TLS, SecOC as well. Then there is a question regarding um, CANU. So do we need to configure also the CKN in CANU or just the CAK? So maybe Julia can comment on that one. So Julia, you may- I'm sorry, yes, I have, the problem is actually, I don't see the questions. I don't know why, because I'm the host. I have another few, it seems so. Um, yeah, they, they are hidden a little bit. <laughs> Ah, are they? <laughs> but the the question is whether it's also needed to configure the CKN uh, in Canu or just the CAK. Um, I think in a security profile. I have a look actually. I'm not sure. I think it's in the pre. Yeah, for question actually, we don't have an answer at right now. We can give them later. So my my guess would be yes because otherwise MKA um, like yeah, I think so too. Used I think to to identify the... the key so it it is transmitted as part of the MKA protocol. So my guess is that it it will be configured in Canu, but you can maybe you can check it. Yeah. Meantime. Just... 
Yeah, then, then let's let's just jump to the next question. Um, how long does it take for the two nodes to exchange the keys, like the MKA phase? Um, so of course it's it's hard to give a general answer on that because the answer depends on the um, on the hardware that is used on the available resources. So especially during the startup, an ECU usually um, performs many different tasks, and so it's it's not really um, yeah, clear how many resources can be spent on the MKA itself. But what we can say is that MaxSec and MKA is something that is very fast, fast, especially compared to protocols like TLS or um, Ike, which is, which is used for IPsec. So just to give some, some orientation here, um, for MKA, we are usually talking about milliseconds. So let's say something like 100 milliseconds, just as a, as a very rough ballpark estimate here, depending on hardware resources and so on, um, that this MKA can, um, can take. So of course, there might be some tuning of parameters involved and so on, but that's just the very, very rough number to give here. What is also um, impacting this number is the communication between the host and the transceiver. So that the host has to actually configure the trans transceiver and this is usually um, done via a quite slow interface. Um, so this also takes some time. But just to give you some, some numbers, so we are definitely below a second and more in the range of um, 100 milliseconds plus minus. And then there is a question um, that Microsoft Classic supports Mac transceiver drivers and whether this means that only file level MacSec is supported or um, also Mac level uh, MacSec. So if there is a controller that supports MacSec in a Mac, then we would be open to support this. Um, but so far, we are not not aware of any um, project that approached us to um, to have this, and also we are not really aware of of any hardware that is supported by Microsoft Classic that would support MacSec within the um, controller. So that's just the current situation. But um, if this changes, and I guess it will change in the future, because actually the the controller would be the let's say the, the proper place to place uh, MacSec then we will support this as well. Okay, I see some more questions in the in the chat window, so. Um, I see also here in the Q&A window two hardware points. I can take over these. Um, first question is, are the pre-shared keys the same on both ports on the hardware? Um, it can be so. It is. It is. All ports are independent. Depend on your configuration and how uh, Canoe is uh, configuring the ports. So, yes and no, depending on your your setup. Um, and next question is: uh, Which multi-gig files are supporting MacSec? Vector is selling a Broadcom file and a Marvel file for multi-gig. Are both supporting MacSec? Yes, both are supporting MacSec in principle, and we will support uh, MacSec on both. I've looked up the question with the pre-shared key with the CKN, and it's in the port configuration. So there's the pre-shared MKA key name um, involved. I see other questions. I don't know if you see them as well going um, about EAP TLS, but is, that is something which at least in Canoe is not supported yet. Yeah, so I, I also see here the question um, or the, let's say the, the, the question whether we can uh, discuss EAP TLS session resumption. Um, so I mentioned that EAP TLS it introduces a lot of delay, especially during the startup, because for EAP TLS we have to to verify certificates, which just takes a long time on on microcontrollers. 
And session resumption is a way to avoid this um, certificate verification and to accelerate the EAP uh, or the TLS handshake. So yes, it's it's possible to do that. But then the question is, why? What is the advantage compared to just using pre-shared um, CAKs again? So it's kind of adding complexity just for the EAP TLS, and then adding an additional complexity for the session resumption to kind of solve a problem that we just introduced before. So it's it's possible, definitely. But um, from from what we see, um, it seems like the more straightforward approach to just use pre-shared CAKs, distribute them once during um, vehicle manufacturing, maybe redistribute them um, when an ECU needs to, re needs to be replaced. But then apart from that, uh, the system is static. So it's not like in an IT system where you got uh, laptops that are joining networks um, yeah, very dynamically in a vehicle all the ECUs they are there so um, a static approach for provi providing the or provisioning the keys seems to be the more yeah the simpler and, and more straightforward way and then I see a question here on canoe whether it's possible to use something else than couple to write maxx script like Python Lua any other <laughs> Scripting languages. <laughs> right, yeah. Maybe is that something we don't like Apple? <laughs> um, so at the moment, I don't think that there is actually any other possibility, and I don't know if there will be. But um, I will ask. Okay. So we have kind of some mechanism, but they are just internal, and I don't think that. It's more like that we have the distributed objects, um, which yeah could be used in other languages, but Maxec, at least in the moment, shouldn't be in this layer and probably won't be. <laughs> and uh, if we do the connection to other languages, don't know. So I, I don't think so, but otherwise I will tell you. Then I see a question um, whether MKA is hosted um, on a separate ECU apart from the ECUs trying to communicate via MAXEC. Um, I, I think this is, at least with MKA, this is usually not the case. It might be possible to somehow proxy this, um, but usually MKA is operated really on the ECUs that are establishing the MAXEC connection. So what we know from IT systems are things, for example, with EAP at TLS, where you can have radius uh, behind this, and then you got kind of, um, yeah, let's say, backend systems involved here. But just for MKA, this is usually operated directly on the systems that operate MAXEC. So, And then I see the question whether hardware-based MAXEC is done in the PHY or on the switch. So the question is, or the answer is both. <laughs> so usually when you have a MAXEC capable switch, then um, the switch fabric itself can have some MAXEC um, hardware in it. And if you just have a single channel ECU with a single transceiver, then this transceiver will do MAXEC. But there are also combinations of this possible. So for example, if you have a switch that cannot do MAXEC or cannot do MAXEC on all ports, it's still possible to yeah, extend the switch by um, adding a transceiver that can do MAXEC. So you can also have a, the possibility to have a switch that um, can do MAXEC using an external MAXEC transceiver. Ah, and I see it's it's about yeah. the VN boxes. So <laughs> yes, I mean the VN box it is uh, completely realized in a in a phi. So this makes us independent for the um, yeah interconnection you can realize on the hardware. So the uh, Maxec support is completely depending on the used Ethernet phi, and yeah, so that's a good answer. 
Okay, I don't see any further questions in any of the WebEx windows. So then I would like to thank you all for joining us here and have a great evening or day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.